This is CBC Here and Now. Three-year-old Branny is recovering after being shot. And he was lying on his side but and licking his leg and it was blood everywhere. I just said, oh my God, he's been shot. I'm Megan McCabe in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, and I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. Okay. There is a problem at Southern Harbor. A license suspended, thousands of pounds of lobsters seized. The province halts production in Southern Harbor. Good evening, I'm Jeremy Eaton. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Well, scary news for any dog owner. Little Branny is recovering at home in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, after being shot a few days ago. Here and now's Megan McCabe went to visit Branny today, and she joins us live from the Kitty Vitty Dog Park. Megan, how is he doing? The little three-year-old rescue dog, who's a Beagle Terrier mix, is pretty lethargic today. And I think the weather may be keeping a lot of dogs away from this park right now. We know it's pretty horrifying for dog owners. Branny had to have his leg amputated Friday night after he was shot. And the police are investigating, although no charges have been laid yet. Only home from the hospital a day, his bandage peeling off as per the vet's instructions, Branny is slowly getting used to life with three legs. His owner, Anne Devine, has really rescued him twice now. She says she was heading to town Friday evening and put the dogs on the deck where they have a doggy door to the house. And then there's a lower yard also off the bottom of the deck which is completely enclosed with a gate at the bottom. So I had put the three of them on the deck and was coming back to the car and just about to get in when I heard a gunshot. Although Devine says she knows who did it, she doesn't want to say too much while the police investigation is underway. She realized Branny was missing and later discovered the gate hadn't properly closed. I found him in the woods, um, not too far from my house and um, just on the path there and he was lying on his side but and licking his leg and it was blood everywhere and I could tell he'd been injured and, and I just said, oh my God, he's been shot. And I scooped him up in my arms and ran back to the car. The vet told her Branny's leg would have to be amputated. Just broke my heart because he's so young, he's got his whole life ahead of him, you know. But they, they assured me he would adapt quite easily because he's a small dog and he's got short legs, he's low on his legs. Hey sweetie boy, you're some good boy. Divine adopted Branny from Beagle Paws and she fosters dogs for them as well. With about a $10,000 vet bill to pay, Divine says the group has kindly set up a donation page for Branny, which is a huge help. Branny's not the only dog who's been shot in the province lately. The RCMP is investigating after two dogs were shot in Trout River and one of them was killed. And in Blanc Sablon, on the Quebec border with Labrador, uh, an eight month old puppy is recovering after he was shot. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Megan McCabe in St. John's. We have more information tonight about the worker killed at a downtown construction site yesterday. Police say he was a 26-year-old man from Conception Bay South. Witnesses reported that the man fell from the top of the 12-story building, the site of a hotel that's under construction on New Gower Street in St. John's. Police want to speak with anyone who witnessed the fall. In the meantime, construction on the Hilton Garden Inn has been stopped while Occupational Health and Safety investigates the cause of the fall. Suffocating lobster, that seems to be what's happening at a seafood operation in Southern Harbor. It's led to a temporary license suspension for Quincy Fisheries and the seizure of a large quantity of live lobster. Here and now is Terry Roberts has this exclusive report. Provincial Fisheries Inspectors seizing more than 100 crates of live lobster this morning. The inspections that have been conducted in the past indicate that there is a problem at Southern Harbor. Up to 100 pounds in each crate, purchased from harvesters in Placentia and Fortune Bays, the company paying anywhere from five to eight dollars per pound. This holding pen, empty, and sources say it's the problem. Poor circulation, shallow water, too many lobster depleting the oxygen supply, many suffocating before being processed. A no-no in this business. Jerry Byrne wouldn't offer any specifics, but said his department had to take action. Says he doesn't want the industry's reputation tarnished. 
there have been a series, series of investigations conducted at Southern Harbour that have produced a set of results that prompt a serious action, the action we've taken, which is to suspend the licence. The licence suspension came as a surprise to fish harvesters in the community, with some telling CBC News they didn't see anything out of the ordinary with the way lobster were being held. The fisheries minister says it's now up to the company to determine when the suspension will be lifted. I'm confident that harvesters will be able to, um, to seek other markets, but as well potentially in the not-too-distant future, should Quincy decide to come to become compliant with the act, uh, that plant will reopen uh, at, the, at the discretion uh, by the actions of the owners themselves. Quincy is a well-known seafood company in the province, purchased by the Royal Greenland Group two years ago. It established an operation in Southern Harbour in 2016, bringing much-needed employment to the community. Quincy manager Simon Jarding did not respond to an interview request. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Southern Harbour. I'm Katie Breen. Coming up, a MUN student didn't let cancer stop her from getting to convocation. Having something to focus on, having something to get up and do the next day um, was a big part of helping me feel better. Balancing university courses and chemotherapy. Brianne's story ahead. So Carolyn, as we saw in Megan McCabe's piece, it was sunny earlier today and it's now started to rain. Yes, it is now moving in uh, towards the Avalon Peninsula. Lots of rain, uh, lots of wind on the way, so it is going to be I hate the wind. <laughs> messy tomorrow, I must say. Unless you're in Labrador, Labrador is going to be gorgeous <laughs> tomorrow. Let's just have a look at uh, what's on the way. Here's our satellite and radar. You can see the system that's affecting the island. It's been tracking from west to east today, just making its way here onto the Avalon Peninsula, bringing lots of rain. We're looking at up to 100 millimeters of rain from this system. Now that's over a long period of time by the time we get to uh, tomorrow night uh, into Thursday. So yeah, lots of rain, but uh, it will be over uh, spread out over a period of time and lots of wind as well. You can see Port of Basque for tonight and right through over to St. John's. Uh, we're looking at gusts up to 100. In particular, tomorrow it's going to be very, very strong. So overnight tonight, you can see the heaviest rains here about 11 o'clock and then this little change over to snow. Don't worry, it won't be too, too much snow, just two to four centimeters. And uh, yes, it's going to really persist in the east uh, throughout the day tomorrow. I'll have more details on that a bit later. Thanks, Carolyn. A judge has dismissed a police request for a rare type of peace bond. The RNC went to court to try to restrict the movements of a man once accused of being the so-called Halifax sleep watcher. The CBC's Rob Antle has the details. Barry Sinclair has been in court many times over the past four decades. He served five federal prison terms. Those are in the past. Now to the present, a different type of decision day a court appearance for something he hasn't been accused of doing, at least not yet, according to police. They believe Sinclair is a risk to commit a serious personal injury offense against a woman, so they went to court for a peace bond to restrict his movements. Today, Judge Mike Madden dismissed the police application. The police feared that Sinclair will commit a break and enter with a voyeuristic component here in this province, watching women sleep for sexual gratification. Today, the judge said Sinclair had exhibited deviant sexual behavior in the past, but has not committed those types of crimes in nearly two decades. And he couldn't conclude that Sinclair will commit a serious personal injury offense again. Sinclair had been accused of voyeurism in Halifax back in 2012 in the so-called Sleepwatcher case involving women in Nova Scotia, but found not guilty. Police in St. John's kept a close eye on Sinclair for the past 15 months. While he was on an interim set of conditions related to the peace bond case, he didn't reoffend, and that police application has now been dismissed. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. A downtown St. John's restaurant that was started by a lottery winner has closed down. David Primer opened the fifth ticket and piano bar on Water Street after he won nearly $4 million in the lotto. Primer decided to sell the piano bar back in March in an effort to get the restaurant through a tough economic slump. Now, in an interview back then, Primer said even with the difficulty of running a business in hard times, he would do it all again if he was given the chance. 
The Child and Youth Advocate says it's time for government to stop clawing back child support payments for parents who are on income support. The government takes every single dollar paid out by a spouse in child support to recover income support. In total, every year about $5 million in support payments end up clawed back into government coffers. And 99.6% of the parents losing out are women. The Child and Youth Advocate says leaving that money with parents would benefit children. I think that, you know, this provides a very real opportunity to have children more actively involved in various activities, for example, in schools that their peers are able to be involved in. It may be able to provide additional funds if there are costs for the child, uh, either medical costs, dental costs, things that are not covered currently. Um, it may be able to provide more nutritional food, uh, clothing. So those are the kinds of very real concrete things that this kind of money would assist a family with. But for our, from our perspective, you know, it's really important that children are, um, are given the opportunity to see that they do have uh, hope and, and opportunities for the future and that they can be treated uh, as equals with their peers. And I think, you know, when you look at children who are living in poverty and on the margins of poverty, $286 a month, that's, that's a significant amount of money. The Single Parents Association is pleased with the push to make changes, and today I spoke with the group. We'll have that interview in about 30 minutes on Here and Now. Crown attorneys in St. John's want to see this man, Mitchell Nippard, behind bars for the next decade. Nippard was convicted of playing a part in two home invasions in Paradise in February of 2017. At a sentencing hearing today in provincial court, the Crown asked for a sentence between 10 and 12 years. His defense lawyer countered by asking for between six and seven years. Nippard addressed the court for the first time, saying he was only guilty by association and had done nothing wrong. Judge Mike Madden will render his sentence July 26th. Unionized workers of the Iron Ore Company of Canada in Labrador City are back on the job. This comes after 1,300 workers spent almost two months on strike. The vote yesterday to accept the latest offer from IOC won by a strong margin, 79%. The, new, the union said the offer included pension increases and a higher drug cap. Now, previously, some workers had to pay out of pocket after reaching a $40,000 cap. That's since been eliminated. And also included in the deal, an increase in probation for new employees. And the union says any new hires will be full-time employees, not temporary workers. Lots of feedback today to a story we brought you last night on Here and Now about a young Newfoundland doctor now working in New York State. Christopher Nicholas says he and his wife wanted to remain here in their home province. Eastern Health even paid him a $50,000 bursary to seal the deal. But when that job offer was rescinded, Nicholas was told to keep the money and look for work elsewhere. Despite the loss, Health Minister John Hagee is standing by the province's bursary program today, saying Nicholas' story was rare, and so is the Premier. We've seen a number of our own that have come back to the bursary program and, and have offered and delivered some significant health care uh, services you know, to people all over this province. So this is, this, in this particular case here, as the Minister Hagee had said inside, was just the second time that we've seen this particular case here. So well, there's some good stories out there of, uh, of retention and recruitment from Newfoundland and Labrador born and raised. Uh, so there is some good stories that's happening out there. But can we do better? Of course we can. A British Columbia man has rolled into town in his office on wheels, and he's all revved up to support local kids. The Million, dollar, the million bus dollar Bus pro the million dollar bus Project is launching a new campaign in partnership with a local nonprofit. The goal, raise $5,000 for a program called Smart Snack. Smart Snack is designed to help the more than 200 kids in the St. John's area who need food support. The motto, empower kids to be healthy, not hungry. Hey guys, welcome to the Million Dollar Bus. We are uh, traveling across Canada and raising a million dollars for community projects. Uh, starting with our man right here uh, from Bridges to Hope. Uh, this is Jody Williams and uh, we're excited to be raising $5,000 for the Smart Snack program. Having something to focus on, having something to get up and do the next day um, was a big part of helping me feel better. 
From chemotherapy to convocation, this is a big day for one Memorial student. Katie Breen has that story coming up. Oh, boys, open your eyes. There's no need for a four-year wait for anybody. What happens when your healthcare system needs triage? Join CBC for a public forum on fixing Newfoundland and Labrador's healthcare system. Share your stories and solutions. Thursday from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at Munn's Bruno Centre. You can also watch live on Here and Now or at CBC NL's Facebook page. More details at cbc.ca slash nl. A scathing report today from Canada's Auditor General blames government for the Phoenix pay scandal. Michael Ferguson says both the previous Conservative government and the current Liberal one had a chance to prevent problems with the new federal pay system. Government culture stands in the way of achieving truly successful results for people. In our audit on building and implementing the Phoenix pay system, we concluded that that project was an incomprehensible failure of project management and project oversight. The price tag to implement and fix Phoenix has already surpassed $1 billion. And earlier this month, it was revealed there were 600,000 cases still pending. 
papers, tests, exams, most second year university students are already under enough stress as it is. But one was especially motivated to study and to not let cancer slow her down. At just 19, Brianne Marshall was diagnosed with stage 3 Hodgkin's lymphoma. Today, she's 22 and a new graduate. Here and now's Katie Breen was at Memorial University earlier today for Brianne's convocation. So Katie, what did you learn about her? Well, Brianne got the diagnosis during the middle of her final exams, but she wrote them anyway, determined to beat cancer and graduate. I was just kind of frustrated that something was getting in my way, quite honestly. Um, so I just wanted to keep going any way that I could. And she did. She graduated today on schedule. She says the thought of quitting MUN never even crossed her mind. She didn't want to get behind. Brianne took online courses while getting chemo. She'd time manage, fitting study around her sometimes six hour long treatments. Having something to focus on, having something to get up and do the next day um, was a big part of helping me feel better and distracting yourself and doing something else. And it was also like obviously pretty productive. Brianne says for her, Cancer was a mental game. The chemo didn't make her too sick, so school helped occupy her mind, and she chose not to open up about her battle. The students surrounding her today, for the most part, didn't know what she went through to claim her convocation seat. She didn't tell friends. She didn't tell professors. I didn't want to be, I guess, grade it differently, or like I didn't think it should impact my work, so I just wasn't going to let it. Brianne Marshall. Winner of the University Medal for Academic Excellence in Law and Society. A simple walk with a heavy backstory. But Brianne doesn't see it that way. I'm definitely not the only one that's had cancer at MUN. Um, and I'm definitely not the only one that's had struggles. So I don't think that that's something people can't relate to. She's cancer free now. What she has is a degree. A Bachelor of Arts with a major in Law and Society. But this isn't where Brianne's schooling ends. She's been accepted into law school at the University of New Brunswick. She starts that degree in September. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Katie Breen in St. John's. Just knowing that like people our age went out like fighting for Newfoundland and Britain. The Rooms has launched a new teaching tool to help grade 8 students across this province learn about Newfoundland and Labrador's role in the Great War. We'll take you inside a classroom and tell you all about it, coming up.
Welcome back, everyone. The uh, forecast is not that great, but Carolyn, you have a lovely picture to show us that you know has hopeful uh, oh, yes. signs in it. Definitely, definitely feels like a spring when you see the eaglets there yeah. in Cuckold's Cove. So uh, yeah, just a great shot. They're looking well. Thank you to Alex Sweet for uh, posting that on Ryan's Facebook page. Just a great sight to behold for sure. Yeah, they fly away. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Well, what won't be so great to behold will be the weather over the next uh, few days. We are looking at uh, heavy rain overnight tonight and into tomorrow in the east and that rain changing over to snow for parts of the west and central and a very wet and windy Wednesday uh, for the east. We have a rainfall warning in effect for Bonavista and most of the Avalon Peninsula up to 100 millimeters of rain uh, between tonight and uh, by the time the system moves off by Thursday. Thursday night, so lots of rain on the way. You'll want to clear out your drains, make sure everything is prepared. There's also a wind warning in place, so not only all the rain, but we have all of the wind for all of the Avalon Peninsula, Bonavista as well, Buren, Conegra, and Porta Basque. So it's going to start pretty heavily in Porta Basque tonight, and in the east, we'll be getting a lot of that wind tomorrow. So this is the system that's tracking across, and that snow I mentioned will be developing overnight. Uh, tonight won't be a whole lot, though, only about two to four centimeters of snow, but you can see how much of the island will be affected by that. And the winds also starting to ramp up there in the west. So we're looking at about 20 to 40 millimeters of rain in the east overnight tonight, 15 to 25 for the Gander area. Not too much uh, over on the west, just about five millimeters and uh, clear skies for Labrador this evening and light winds, cooler temperatures as we move into tomorrow. You can see how things clear there in the west, but in the east and for central, not so much. The system really kind of hangs around and keeps pounding uh, the Avalon Peninsula with rain. And you can see the wind uh, ramping up there to uh, 90 tomorrow, up to 100. So that's what we're uh, we're looking at throughout the day. This is at 9 o'clock tomorrow, and it's still expecting uh, rain there. So another 20 to 40 millimeters expected uh, tomorrow, about 10 uh, for the Gander area. And uh, you can see how things clear there on on the west and temperatures staying fairly cool, but Labrador is looking fantastic. If you're in Lab City tomorrow, you have 16 degrees to look forward to a mix of sun and cloud as well for Churchill Falls. Happy Valley Goose Bay, just beautiful, a little bit cooler along the coast, but still looking like a great day for Labrador tomorrow. So Wednesday night into Thursday, you can see how some showers still kind of linger and all of this cloud cover here, keeping things fairly gray. And we're going to have another system moving in for Labrador West. So I'll get into all of those details a little later. Thanks, Carolyn. Now, thanks to a big financial contribution from the CIBC, the Rooms is in the process of handing out living catalogs to schools all over Newfoundland and Labrador. It's an attempt to bring its Beaumont Hamill and the Trail of the Caribou exhibit to students who can't make it into the St. John's Museum. The catalog looks at the first-hand experience of those who fought and the effect the Great War had on this province. Now, earlier today, I went back to school and sat in on a class at St. Bonaventure's College to learn a little more myself. What makes Beaumont Hamill significant for Newfoundland? This is the yes, catalog for the exhibition Bowman Hamill and the Trail of the Caribou, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians at War and at Home, Whatever. 1914 to 1949. What's the purpose? Why did the rooms want to put that book together? Well, we wanted to do a catalog of this exhibition, and we wanted to be able to provide every school in Newfoundland Labrador with this catalog so that they can use it as an educational tool within the classroom. What sort of things would students find in that book if they were to open it up? Well, they would find all kinds of stories of the people who served in the, the First World War from Newfoundland and Labrador in, in the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, and they would find uh, also what happened here on the home front. Why did the rooms want to put this together to send out to schools across the province? Well, it's really important for the rooms and for our sponsor, CIBC, um, to uh, put out this catalog so that the children across Newfoundland and Labrador would be able to, no matter where you are, if you can't make it in the St. John's, be able to be exposed to the stories and read the stories and look at the artifacts that we have here at the rooms. How about some of the uh, Newfoundlanders who won, um, who were recognized for military valor, who won medals overseas? Bridget? Uh, John Shiva. What made John Shewak significant? Uh, he was like known for shooting. Well, just knowing that like people our age went out like 
fighting for Newfoundland and Britain and all that. Does that freak you out a bit? A little, like I couldn't really picture myself like willing to leave my family and stuff and my like dog and cat. Uh, it's been pretty significant. The opportunity to go over to the rooms and uh, look at different artifacts, read stories, um, helps bring the, the stories of, of uh, the past alive for our students in a way that maybe the textbook can't. And how do students, particularly these grade 8 students behind you, uh, react to something that happens, a very significant thing that happened, but it's been more than 100 years, and how do young people, uh, how do they absorb that, or how do they react when they hear about what you teach them? Uh, we, like you said, it, it did happen a while ago, but there's, um, I think the stories resonate, the, uh, the idea of young people not much older than themselves going overseas, um, being caught up in a, in a major event. So it's, um, it's the opportunity to read about those stories, see those stories, see the artifacts um, that helps make it a little bit more real. So they, they recognize the differences in the past, but also see um, some similarities between their lives and, uh, and the lives that were lived, you know, going on 100 years ago now. This book probably took a long time, a lot of your time, I guess, to put together. So how long did you work on this, Maureen? I worked on this for a full year. Yeah, and what it was, we took the text that was written in the exhibition and we uh, edited it. It turns out you need to do a lot of editing to exhibition text to make it into, it makes sense in a book. And we rearranged the stories because the exhibition is done differently than a, a book would be, which is more chronological. And we also wanted to expand some of the stories. So in this uh, catalog, we have expanded the stories of the other battles that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians were involved in in the First World War. And we've been able to actually tell more stories and uh, add some people that didn't make it into the exhibition into the book. And for you on a personal note, uh, did it bring you, I guess, did you learn anything from this? Did uh, any interesting takeaways that you didn't know before you started this project? Oh, well, you're always learning, you know, especially learning about putting together a catalog and, and also the different stories and expanding the stories of the other battles and learning more about Manchi and uh, the other battles that almost had the same uh, casualty amounts as Bowman Hamill that you don't really you know, Bowman Hamill is always in the forefront as the main battle, but then you realize that they lost just as many, close to just as many in Manchu Le Prue and uh, the prisoners of war and their stories, which is also incredibly dramatic. We were really happy with the sponsorship from the uh, CIBC. The bank CIBC gave us the uh, opportunity to put this catalog together and the money to be able to send it out to every school, and they were very interested in making sure that it was sent out to every school so that every child in Newfoundland and Labrador could learn about their history and the sacrifices that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians made during the Great War. Well, Maureen, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for telling me about this. You're very welcome. And it's a fantastic project to bring that to school children everywhere. Yeah, that's the fourth part. So the first one was the exhibit. Do you remember that opened up back in 2016? And then they have the website, which is still online now. And then they had an education tool that goes out and now this book. Mm -hmm. But I was talking to Maureen and she says that the rooms, staff of the rooms are working on a new exhibit or a new display, which will be on the regatta. And that should open soon. So stay tuned. The St. John's Royal Right, the regatta. Royal St. John's Regatta. <laughs> this is why Debbie Cooper gets paid the big bucks. <laughs> Getting the Trans Mountain Expansion Project built will preserve thousands of good, well-paying jobs. The Finance Minister calls it an investment in Canada's future, a $4.5 billion decision by the federal government to buy the Trans Mountain Pipeline. What does Premier Dwight Ball think? The story and reaction next.
Welcome back to Here and Now. If no private investor shows up and if Kinder Morgan shareholders give the go-ahead, Canadian taxpayers could be going into the pipeline business this summer. The federal government announced this morning it will buy the existing Trans Mountain Pipeline from Alberta to B.C. along with the assets needed to finish the expansion. This $4.5 billion investment represents a fair price for Canadians and will allow the project to proceed under the ownership of a Crown Corporation. So Julie Van Dusen is following the story from Parliament Hill. Julie, what exactly does $4.5 billion buy these days? Well, you would hope a lot. The federal government says it's a financial buffer that allows the pipeline to go ahead. So it gives it the green light for those construction jobs uh, to start. But it doesn't mean that uh, we now own a pipeline, not today or tomorrow. The government is going to work with Kinder Morgan until August to try to find a buyer for this pipeline. But should it not happen by August, yes, we do own a pipeline. We'll own that, the expansion of it, um, the uh, the terminal ports in B.C. where, where the oil goes on the tankers, a whole kit and caboodle, including the work crews. Uh, the government says it is a great investment. It's going to create 15,000 jobs. Certainly the Conservatives say it. we want a pipeline, but we don't think it should be done at taxpayers' expense. So take a listen to Andrew Shear. $4.5 billion? That's just the down payment on the total investment that the that on the total spending that's going to be required on this. And it's coming out of taxpayers' money and it was completely unnecessary. What's the reaction from the two premiers on the very front lines of this dispute, Julie? Well, you can imagine that Alberta's premier, Rachel Notley, is ecstatic. She's wanted this for a long time to boost the economy in her province. She's willing to put $2 billion behind it in case there's any unforeseen costs. Now, her neighbour, of course, B.C. Premier John Horgan, is not happy at all. He says he will continue to fight it. He's worried about, um, you know, a catastrophic oil spill, as he says. He says the only upside is that now at least he'll know who to call if something should happen. He can call Justin Trudeau. Trudeau in Ottawa instead of looking for someone in Texas. So take a listen to uh, Rachel Notley followed by John Horgan. They may be able to mess with Texas but they can't mess with Alberta and it may well be not Ottawa either. Investors who are behind this pipeline now will not back off. I do believe that uh, the federal government now is totally accountable not just for regulation and, and approval uh, of, a, of a pipeline but they now are responsible from uh, well head to tide water and beyond. So as I said, Debbie, the construction can start any day. And of course, the protesters uh, say well, they're not going anywhere. So it could be a long, hot summer. Thanks so much, Julie. That's our Julie Van Dusen, senior reporter at CBC's Parliamentary Bureau in Ottawa. Premier Dwight Ball was asked about the pipeline purchase today at the House of Assembly. He saw the federal government's move as a good sign for the oil and gas industry. Me, I'm pleased to see that the federal government is getting involved in natural resources again. So any investment that we would see in Alberta that you know helps facil facilitate getting their oil to tidewater, it's good news for all of Canada. Uh, we, we feel and we know, based on the research that we have, that there's a tremendous amount of resource out there around oil and gas that we really need to develop as well. Uh, we've, seen the, uh, we've seen the importance of this for Alberta now. And in, in a similar fashion, we feel it could be very important for Newfoundland and Labrador in the future. An unmet ransom demand means the personal information of 90,000 bank customers could be at risk. It comes after CIBC-owned Simply Financial and the Bank of Montreal revealed they were targeted by hackers. In an email, the hackers threatened to release account holder data by midnight midnight, sorry, midnight Monday if they were not paid $1 million. The email included the dates and birth the dates of birth and social insurance numbers of two Canadians. Now, CBC confirmed with account holders that the information was accurate. When asked, BMO says their practice is to not make payments to fraudsters, and Simply Financial says they are working with cybersecurity experts to protect their clients' data. Well, the Single Parents Association is applauding the push to change the province's income support rules. As we've reported, right now, government claws back dollar-for-dollar dollar income support from any parent who receives child support from a former spouse. 
Almost all the parents affected are single mothers, and many of them come here to the association offices on Logie Bay Road in St. John's. More than 125 single parent families are fed with monthly hampers, and there's a thrift outlet with clothes and household items. Elaine Balsam is the executive director of the Single Parents Association. I think it's a move that should have come a lot sooner. This means that single parent families will have extra income and they're not having to resort to, will I pay this bill, let this one go. They can avail of more services, provide more for their children in terms of food and opportunities and activities. It's going to make a tremendous difference. So you agree that child support from a former spouse should not be considered income support? That is correct. Yeah. Do you know, Elaine, if uh, this is what happens in other provinces, that it's clawed back dollar for dollar? Well, in some provinces, they've already made the move uh, that it's not clawed back, mm -hmm. and it's given to them because if you're going to claw it back, then they're losing. They're not going to gain anything. They're still at the same ground mm -hmm. level. So I think it's a move. Single parents only have one source of income. A lot of families, you know, that are not single have two sources. So this allows the children, especially children, to get ahead and to pursue a f positive future and be empowered for that. Now the money that uh, government is clawing back uh, is, we're told, just under $300 a month, roughly. Uh, it doesn't seem a lot to some people, but how significant is that to the people that you see coming here? It is significant to our clients because our clients, uh, we have a thrifty outlet as well, and it's a very low charge for using it. We don't charge per item, and sometimes they do not have the monies to avail of that. That's only $3 for a large garbage bag, uh, but sometimes they have to make decisions that, okay, if I spend money on this, then I can't have money for a bus fare or money for my child to get to school or f for school lunch. So it comes to making the decision where I have to use my money. Mm -hmm. So this $300 is going you know, allowing them to have that money is extra money they'll have every month. So they're not, you know, maybe there's other things they can do and their children can have the lunch and perhaps feel more you know, like their classmates and their friends. Mm. Is there a personal story that you could tell me about uh, a single mother? Because mostly single parents are, almost all of yeah. them are women. Mm -hmm. Is there a story, an anecdote that you can tell about somebody who came to you with a hard, ca hard luck case? Yes, actually, I was just talking to a mom today. Uh, she is um, on income support, and uh, she has, she doesn't, the uh, income support will say that because you're getting child support, then you don't get this amount of money. They'll cut it off the check even before she gets it. So she's waiting to get this, and then it doesn't turn up. So she's out money, and then she has to fight to get it back from income support. Mm -hmm. That's a hardship in terms of food for the month. It creates hardship for rent, uh, for bus passes, for any type of activity in their lives. So, and I mean, it just gives them the feeling like they can't get ahead, they're not getting anywhere. Mm. So, you know, it's definitely gonna mean a plus plus. So how hopeful are you that government is reviewing the Child Advocates Report and that they will make this change to do, as the advocate said, bring in a progressive policy for children? I think that's what we need to remember, it's for the children. So we want to have, a generation going forward that can continue to support our province and help it grow. We need to empower these children now. So by making this first step, it's a step in the right direction. Elaine Balsam, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Could it be one of the shortest lived TV series? ABC cancels the revamp of Roseanne after racist comments on Twitter made by its star, Roseanne Barr.
It's time now to meet our Young Athlete of the Day, and this is six-year-old Lauren Winters from St. John's. She's a member of Cygnus Gymnastics. Lauren attended the Lady Luck International Gymnastics Meet in Los Angeles, sorry, Las Vegas in January. Ooh, nice. pretty good. Vegas, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and while, uh, while there, she won two medals in her age group out of the 87 participants, so congratulations, Lauren. Excellent. We're from South End School in Southeast Bike, and you're watching Here and Now. Some fresh faces made it to <laughs> right here yeah. earlier this morning. The children from St. Anne's School, Southeast Bite. And there, there. look. Playing with the green screen, that's. Oh, yeah, that's always a hit with the kids. Mm -hmm. Just watch the disappearing yeah. Harry Ooh. Potter like. Amazing. The invisible vanishing. Cloak. Invisible, <laughs> that's it. I was going to say vanishing. Cloak of invisibility. <laughs> that's right. Jeremy. Every time we have kids uh, who. Oh, look, and there's students. our director, Rod Dobbin, doing his thing. Look yeah. at them, look at them. Yeah, they love that. <laughs> well, and of course, wouldn't? look at the green screen behind. They have. Um, that moving through the jungle mm -hmm. scene. That's it is really stuff. a magic place. Yeah, so hopefully they had lots of fun in our studio mm. today. Well, let's What have about the weather? Is the weather the lots weather. of fun or what? <laughs> it's uh, not so much. It's interesting. There's certainly a lot happening. So uh, let's get right to it and uh, have a look at uh, the highs today. Temperatures not that great uh, today. Happy Valley Gooseby, I know you were really warm there yesterday with your 22 degrees, but back down to 10 degrees. Things will be warming up though in Labrador and on the island. Yeah, it's in the, you know, low double digits for most places. And of course, we do have all that rain moving in tonight in the east. Uh, we're getting up to 100 millimeters of rain by the time the system moves off tomorrow night. So yeah, you'll want to clear out your drains and get everything ready. There's also going to be the wind factor with that. We have a wind warning in effect uh, for Porta Basque, Conegra, the Rio Peninsula, Avalon Peninsula, and for Bonavista. So tomorrow is going to be very windy, very, very wet uh, for sure. So we're also looking at a bit of a snowfall for the Northern Peninsula down through uh, central overnight tonight. Not a huge amount though, just about two to four centimeters. So nothing really to worry about. And uh, tomorrow morning, looking at maybe that messy snow rain mix as well in the Badger area. And you can see the winds really ramping up there uh, tomorrow morning and the system lingering throughout the day on Wednesday. So getting up to about four degrees uh, in St. John's tomorrow, we're expecting another 20 to 40 millimeters of rain throughout the day tomorrow. Not so bad for central uh, Grand Falls winds are about five millimeters there, but you can see where that snow rain mix could happen uh, tomorrow afternoon, clearing off very nicely though on the west coast and Labrador, as I mentioned, looking lovely tomorrow. Lab City 16 degrees as the high with a mix of sun and cloud 17 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So overall quite a nice day uh, in Labrador tomorrow. So Wednesday evening uh, you can see the showers still kind of hang around until we get late in the night. So we're looking at a pretty gray day right straight through tomorrow into tomorrow night. But things do clear off in the west and uh, for the southeastern Labrador. But the cloud cover and showers in western Labrador really kind of stick around and uh, we'll have another system moving in for western Labrador. So much of Labrador can expect a mostly cloudy day uh, with a chance of some showers, but nice warm temperatures, 20 degrees as the high on Thursday afternoon. Nice on the west coast, 16 with a mix of sun and cloud, and we're looking at the chance of showers for central and the east. Much cooler uh, in St. John's for sure. And as we head into Friday, Labrador City looking at another system moving through, bringing some rain uh, to that area. Chance of showers for eastern Labrador. Could see more showers as well Friday afternoon in the east and in central, but temperatures warming up a little bit at least. So that's something to look forward to. And you can see the more showers moving in as we head into Saturday evening. A chance of some flurries uh, there in southeastern Labrador. And as we get into the weekend, Sunday evening, more showers potentially for the island. Clearing off, though, as we head into Monday and into Tuesday. So in your long range, yeah, we're looking at lots of showers uh, for the rest of the week and also some clearing there as we head into uh, Tuesday and clearing as well for uh, parts of Labrador Monday. Not looking too bad. Things cooling down on Tuesday. Debbie. 
Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, some international news now. ABC has scrapped its recently revived sitcom, Roseanne. The network pulled the comedy after the show's star, Roseanne Barr, posted racist tweets. Here with the details is arts reporter Yelena Adzik. Just months after the show Roseanne premiered, the reboot of the hit 90s sitcom is now off the air. This as a result of a tweet today where comedian Roseanne Barr referenced former Obama White House advisor Valerie Jarrett as a product of the Muslim Brotherhood and Planet of the Apes. The online backlash led to the removal of the tweet and an apology from Roseanne saying, I apologize to Valerie Jarrett and to all Americans. I'm truly sorry for making a bad joke about her politics and her looks. I should have known better. Forgive me, my joke was in bad taste. Well, shortly after, fellow comedian and producer Wanda Sykes said she would not be returning. And then Roseanne's network, ABC, pulled the show altogether, saying Roseanne's Twitter statement is abhorrent, repugnant, and in consistent with our values and we have decided to cancel her show. Her agency, ICM Partners, also dropped her as a client and her campaign for the Emmy Awards has been suspended. Now for years, Roseanne Barr has been known to court controversy as a political button pusher. She's a vocal Trump supporter and one of the biggest promoters of online far-right conspiracy theories. She's even evoked an ape reference regarding another African-American female politician in the past. Still, she rose up to become the lead star of her own show that had more than 18 million viewers for the premiere episode in March, with President Trump phoning in to congratulate her the next day. So up until today, Roseanne was the second highest rated show on network television after This Is Us. Now, this is done. Yelena Adzik, CBC News, Toronto. I'll check out this viewer photo of the day. How cool is this? That's pretty cool. Yeah, some low tide there. Uh, Exposing some space underneath the, all of the ice. Um, it's like a frozen wave. <laughs> well, it, that Surf's is up, bro. <laughs> so beautiful, really. Hard to guess where it could be, but I'll tell you, it's somewhere in Labrador. Oh, I'll have the answer coming up. A tiny bear cub will survive thanks to the efforts of a keen-eyed whale tour operator. John Ford and his wife Jennifer Stevens spotted the cub last Friday on an island near Tofino, British Columbia, is trying to suckle from its dead mother. Hey, is that better, little buddy? Oh, oh, oh. 
So Ford and two others headed back to the island and after a couple of tries managed to capture the cub. He says the mother was likely dead for days and the cub would not have survived on its own. So obviously they did have to intervene. The hungry cub is now at a wildlife recovery center dining on pablum and vitamins. The center will distance it from humans over the next few days and try to release it back into the wild in about 18 months. Good luck to that little one. It's already had some good luck. Well, yeah, bad, so good, did. and hopefully and better. And he's adorable <laughs> as a little baby black bear. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if I'd want to hang out with him when he was older. What so a gorgeous cute. spot of the country, too. Look Tofino's at that. amazing. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, here's something else that's gorgeous. Our viewer photo of the day. Isn't this nice? Our uh, director, Roddy Dobbins, said that this looks like the bottom of a, bo of a boat. Certainly does. Yeah, it certainly, certainly does. does. The keel there, and yeah. it's up and dry dock. So where is it, too? <laughs> where was this picture taken? Makovic. Oh, beautiful. Yes, Makovic uh, Bay River at low tide. Thank you very much, uh, Robert Anderson, for sending that in, posting it on Ryan's Facebook page. And Ryan will be back tomorrow as well. Mm -hmm. Another beautiful part of the country, Makovic. Mm -hmm. Beautiful picture. And, and it's going to be beautiful there tomorrow. <laughs> not, so much here, not so much here. Not so much here. We got to, you know, blame it on the rain because the <laughs> rain don't mind and the rain don't care. And of course, uh, of course, uh, Carolyn uh, Ryan is always looking for more pictures like that. I oh, guess definitely <laughs> keep them coming for sure. Post them on Ryan's Facebook page or on the CBC and L Facebook page as well. So we look for, for photos there. So a lot of talented photographers in this province. So definitely. keep them coming because we like looking at them. <laughs> well, thanks very much for being here. Here. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for having Carolyn. Me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we hope you have a great night. And uh, show will be back tomorrow. See you then. Good night.